Hey. Can anybody hear me? Excellent. Yes, we hear you. Fantastic. Okay. Now, is David Searle the David that I was told about? You're muted. Hang on a second. Yes, hello, Rabbi. Hi, David. How are you? Excellent. Fine. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Nice to meet everybody. Okay. This is only on... So good evening, everyone. We will be starting very shortly. Thank you for, for your patience.
day. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm not Rabbi Rakowski. I have the pleasure of introducing him tonight on the behalf of the uh, Shara Adult Learning Center. And uh, it is with great pleasure that I'm introducing you, uh, Rabbi Rakowski, who is a native of Rochester, New York, uh, who we almost had the pleasure of seeing this Saturday at Shul, if it were not for the weather. In August 2015, he assumed the position of rabbi at Congregation Shara Tefila in Dallas, Texas. He is a sought after speaker and leader within the American Jewish world. And uh, may I just add as well, um, when looking up a bit for this uh, this evening, presenting Rabbi Rukowski, I fell upon his blog um, posts uh, for uh, the synagogue uh, uh, Shara Tefila. And uh, where there's a lot that we can learn about uh, synagogues. So Rabbi Rakowski clearly has a love for uh, synagogues around the world, history of synagogues, and uh, I encourage you to check that out. I'll be sharing the link later on, just because I think that might be interesting to everyone. Rabbi Rakowski, we look forward to hearing you tonight talk about um, uh, this series that's beginning this evening. So I'll, I'll, I won't say any more. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to meet all of you virtually. Uh, those of you who are members of my shul, I know personally, and I thank you also for joining. But uh, And I look forward to the opportunity to for a make update when I get to meet the rest of you in person. Uh, and uh, even though the, in absentia, I want to thank Rabbi Fishman uh, and uh, Rabbi Shire, Rabbi Cold, Fe Rabbi Cold Feingold, and Cantor Zellermeyer for the opportunity to uh, to participate, to be a to be a virtual member of of the Shar clergy and teach and teach uh, and share uh, thoughts of Torah and thoughts of history with you for the next three weeks. Um, before we begin, just an order of housekeeping: the um, the the promotional literature for this program said that I was going to be talking about. Uh, the the Maimonidean controversy, and that's not accurate, and not because um, God forbid anybody is uh, a liar, but because um, I realized, uh, even though the, these were some of the the books of the Rambam were some of the original banned books, to really do justice to the controversy surrounding that would take a series of probably seven to ten classes, and also other people have done it already and have done it better. Uh, I want to commend to your attention the Jewish History podcast of Rabbi Dr. David Katz, who teaches at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, lives in Baltimore, and he just did, he just concluded a seven-part series about the Maimonidean controversies, and I recommend his podcast to you on any subject. Uh, but in particular on, on this one. We're going to deep dive into some of the works that maybe get covered a little bit less. And, uh, and, and for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about some really pivotal works that were banned uh, bef before we actually get into it. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves, send it in the chat. Um, it won't get answered right away if it's in the chat, just because I'm working with a PowerPoint presentation and I, I won't necessarily see your chats right away. And also, please feel free to email me directly at rabbi at Um That uh, information will be on the very first slide of the presentation. So just give me a moment and we will begin. But before we do, let's just ask a, a, a fundamental question. What's the purpose of banning a book? Why would it be necessary or why would people feel that it is necessary to ban a book? You can feel free to, again, we're not on the presentation yet. You can send an answer in through chat. You can raise your hands, unmute yourselves. I am pinned, but I will, I'll remove the pin so I could see uh, people who are, if you want to answer. Why would it be a, people feel that it is necessary to ban a book? I see somebody actually raising their, um, Oro Librovich. Yes. That, am I pronouncing uh, your name correctly? Please correct me if yes, I'm not. Yes, Oro is uh, Spanish for gold. Oh, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I suppose that banning a book will be to preserve a sort of 
orthodoxy, um, if it's for Jews, uh, mm -hmm. you know, among Jews, to warn them that this book is not uh, appropriate. Okay, so orthodoxy with a capital O and a lowercase O, right? To right. Um, to kind of preserve some type of theological. Uh, I don't. I, I'm gonna. The next word that I use, whether it's integrity, purity, whatever the case might be, uh, there 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 would be a reason to uh, to leave that book out. Right? Uh, that book belong does not belong in our community, in our theology, that kind of thing. Anybody else? <coughs> Um, go ahead, Yoram. Uh, okay, banning a book, which we are experiencing here in the States, is when the content of a book is contrary to the culture that bans it. They feel it is dangerous to them. Okay, good. So, and, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned in the States. So in, in the year 2022, there were... Um, 16 that 1648 titles that were banned by various school districts for various reasons some of them not far from where i am sitting right now i'm sitting right here in dallas so a district in keller there was a rumor that a district in keller texas not far from here uh, removed a graphic representation of the of the diary of anne frank be, after it was challenged by uh but for being too violent, perhaps, or whatever, the content being objectionable. Uh, and so there were rumors that this district banned the Diary of Anne Frank. Now, that was not accurate. They removed, they kept the copies of the actual diary, meaning the, 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 what was the written diary, but the graphic representation was removed temporarily for review after it was challenged, and then it was reinstated. But the fact that people could think and take seriously that the diary of Anne Frank was banned is a sign not of the veracity of that statement, but of kind of the climate which we're living in, which books are being banned right and left, not just among the Jewish community. So Janice Schwartz, who is uh, also a mem member of my community, she put in the chat that it is about control. And, um, and that is true as well. There are a number of reasons why everybody, everything that everybody said until now is correct, to preserve an, an orthodoxy, to preserve some type of ideology, to protect people from ideas, which they may be and have no context to process, and that could wreak havoc with their intellectual, spiritual, or religious, or even emotional lives. Uh, in other words, it depends who you're asking about why the book is being banned. If you are asking the people who oppose it, they will tell you one thing. And if you ask the people who support the ban, they will tell you something else. And there are different reasons that a book might be banned, and there are different kinds of bans. I mean, there are different um, uh, uh, the um, the the uh, the bans uh, may be of a person who is of suspect or known heretical ideas. And if such a person writes a book, even if there is nothing inherently objectionable in that book, the ban might be because the person who is writing the book doesn't have or has already is suspicious by virtue of the book that they have written, that they them, that because they wrote the book. Another is where a person might generally be considered to be, we'll use the word kosher, right? And that person writes a book, the contents of which might be um, problematic or uh, heretical uh, for whatever reason. And then the third is when a heretic writes something heretical. Now that one, when someone kosher writes something kosher, they don't get banned. When somebody heretical writes something heretical, it's no surprise that they get banned. It's the middle uh, area where somebody heretical writes something there that's not objectionable, or where something where somebody who is not objectionable writes something that might be considered heretical, and they're not given the benefit of the doubt. It is in that area that we are going to be that most of what we're going to be talking about falls, and uh, and I, and we're we're going to see where today's subject, where today's talk falls, and today we're going to be speaking about uh, the. Uh, controversial Torah translation, the Torah commentary of Moses Mendelssohn called the Biur. Now, give me just one moment and I'm going to share the screen. Uh, 
it, I'll also point out that if anybody has any questions that I failed to answer, someone asked me how many banned books I say were in 2022. As of October 2022, it was 1,648. Once again, if you have any questions that you want to ask me that I failed to uh, to answer in the uh, it, it, and you want more time, for, first of all, email me directly. I'll also be happy to send you a copy of this PowerPoint of this slide presentation. So just one moment. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, here we go. Second. Hang on. Here. Have to stop that. And my apologies. I am. I need to. I'm still trying to figure all of this out. Um, okay. Here we go. All right. Okay. Um, the title, uh, Hold My Beer, I, I do like um, punny titles um, sometimes. Okay, and here is my contact information, rabbi at shardtofield.org. Again, please, please feel free to reach out. Who was Moses Mendelssohn? Uh, Moses Mendelssohn was born in the year 1729 to a poor German Jewish family in Dessau. Here we have the coat of arms of the town of Dessau, very attractive. Um, the town itself, uh, you know, one of those stereotypical old German towns, big town square, old buildings, not really anything too uh, too exciting. And uh, his father was a sofer. Uh, he wrote Sifrei Torah, Tefillin, Mizuzot, um, and his name was Menachem Mendel. But his original surname was Dessau, after the town they came from. A lot of German Jewish families took the names of the towns that they came from, not just in Germany, it was common in other places as well. Uh, already at a young age, he showed promise, and he seemed destined for a career, for a rabbinic career. Um, he received tutoring. He was an autodidact. He taught himself as well German thought and literature. He received uh, tutoring from Rav David Frankel, who was the Rav of Dessau at the time. Rav David Frankel, um, one second, go back. Rav David Frankel was the first person to turn a serious eye to the study of the Jerusalem Talmud. And he wrote a very important commentary that is still used to this very day in the study of the German Talmud. And the title of the commentary is called the Korban Ha'eda. And it was a very important uh, commentary, still is, as I said. And it was under the tutelage of Rav David Frankel that he was exposed to the thought of the Rambam, especially the Moreh HaNevuchim, the guide for the perplexed, which we alluded to earlier, having been the sort of the ultimate uh, guidebook to rationalist Jewish thought. In 1742, um, he, beca he became a, a student, he, he, sorry, he was a student of David Frankel, and he became the, uh, Rabbi David Frankel was invited to be the chief rabbi of Berlin. Moses Mendelssohn followed him. Where did the name Mendelssohn come from? His father's name was Menachem Mendel, Abraham Mendelssohn. That was Moses' son. He wrote a letter to his son, who was the composer Felix Mendelssohn. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He said that uh, he felt that the name Moses Ben Mendel Dessa would handicap him in gaining the needed access to those who had the better education at his disposal. Dessau felt low class, it seems. He felt that uh, his own father would not take offense, and so he began to call himself Mendel's son, the son of Mendel. That the change, though small, was decisive. He he studied. So again, he's now a student of Rav David Frankel. He moves to Berlin to uh, he moves to Berlin to uh, study with him and to stay with him, and he. Um, and, and, and he continued to study with him Tanakh, the Talmud. Um, Moses Mendelssohn was, as a child, he was a sickly child. He had a hunchback. 
was his family was concerned that he wouldn't be able to withstand the relocation, the journey to Berlin, but he did succeed. He actually succeeded beyond anybody's wildest expectations. He was he became a student of uh, Israel Zamosh, uh, who taught him math. He taught him. Uh, in, in fact, he was self-taught in Latin, uh, it, it, mostly self-taught. He did learn the basics from a Jewish physician, and while he was, and he bought a Latin copy of John Locke's an essay concerning human understanding, and he mastered it into the original Latin with the aid of his rudimentary Latin education, and also a Latin dictionary. He learned French as well. He, uh, at the same time, he served as an apprentice to a silk merchant named Isaac Bernhardt who made him a, a bookkeeper and a partner. It was a, Isaac Bernhardt was a Jew as well. At this time, he meets Gotthold Ephraim, Ephraim Lessing. He was a dramatist, a literary critic, uh, and uh, certainly a well-known uh, figure in the intellectual circles of Berlin. He wrote a play called Nathan the Wise, which features three protagonists. Nathan was a Jew the Sultan Saladin and a Templar, Knights Templar. And the, in this, they attempt to bridge the gaps between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The theme of the play was that even people who are not Christian, especially Jews, are capable of achieving nobility of character. The, Frederick the Great, Frederick of Prussia, was, uh, was reigning at the time. And this was a notion that was considered ridiculous uh, and in fact, uh, got uh, Lessing into some trouble, but he was able to somehow wiggle out of it. Lessing and Moses Mendelssohn became dear friends, very close friends. Uh, and in fact, whenever he spoke about Jews who attained nobility of character, Lessing would refer to Moses Mendelssohn uh, as well. Um, In 1763, he's, of course, immersed in the world of philosophy and philosophers. He's participating in the events of the German Enlightenment, what we often call, when it spilled into the Jewish community, it was known as the Haskalah. In 1763, he was granted, the Moses Mendelssohn was granted the privileged status of protected Jew. Um, one of the reasons for this was that he also wrote poetry praising Frederick the Great. Uh, in, in German, I think also in Hebrew to be said in synagogues. Um, so Frederick the Great did him the very uh, nice favor of giving him the status of protected Jew that refers to Jews that were engaged in essential occupations. And they were allowed to live in places like Berlin, and particularly in Berlin, without being interrupted, without being expelled, and without having to pay municipal taxes. Uh, the trustees of the Jewish community in Berlin also passed at this time a, 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 a law, uh, it was a law that referred to one person, that uh, exempted him from all communal taxes in the same way that communal officials like rabbis, cantors, that they didn't have to pay communal tax either because there was no church separation of church and state. The Jews paid taxes to the Gemeinde, to the community, and they, uh, the community collected taxes for the government on, were on behalf of the government. So, but the community also had the right to exempt people from taxes. Second. In uh, 1761, he goes to Hamburg and he meets Rabbi Yonathan Eibeschitz, the chief rabbi of Hamburg. Now, of course, he was already, he, the, the philosophers loved Moses Mendelssohn, but Rabbi Yonathan Eibeschitz was, was, was a, an extraordinarily prominent Jew. He was the chief rabbi of not just of Hamburg, but of the tripartite community of Altona, Hamburg and Wandsbeck, which at the time was part of the, Dan the Danish kingdom. Rabbi Jonathan Eibeschitz was uh, himself a controversial figure. Uh, he, he was uh, suspected by his arch rival, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, of being a closet follower of Shabtai Tzvi, who had apostatized and then later died some um, nearly 100 years uh, previously. But, and that is the subject of another series of classes that we could absolutely talk about some other time. Rabbi Jonathan Eibschitz was uh, an extremely powerful person at the time. He was, uh, he was a prolific Torah scholar. Still, uh, to, uh, to this day, works of his on almost every discipline still exist, although apparently um, 
there was an encyclopedia that he wrote of some 30 volumes that didn't survive, that uh, was completely lost. But the Gronitz and Ibishitz met Moses Mendelssohn, and Moses Mendelssohn wanted to secure from him the title of what we called Morenu, which is not a rabbinic title because he was not an ordained rabbi, but it is a title that is given to a to a um, to a knowledgeable, and not even just a a, a, a lay person, but somebody who is prominent in a community. He said, and so he wrote in a letter that is filled with biblical allusions. This man Moshe. Uh, we don't know who he is. That's a translation of a verse that refers to Moshe when Moshe was lost, uh, when they didn't know where he was. He's the, on top of Mount Sinai. The verse says, Lo yadanu mehayalo. We don't know what happened to him. So this Moses is Moshe. We don't know who he is, um, but his uh, for his hands, yadav rav lo. His hands are heavy. That you have kavdumi zokin. This is a reference to what happened at the end of last week's, this past week's Torah reading. Moses's hands are heavy, and he's found his way in all matter of wisdom. His name is, I translate it as rabbi, but that's not a, a professional title. Rav Moshe of Dessau. His intellect is complete in the knowledge of Talmud and Talmudic logic. And he said, I can't give him the title of Chaver. Chaver is a title, especially in the German Jewish community that is bestowed upon uh, committed, dedicated, and knowledgeable lay people. But he says the Chaver is not enough for him. But I also can't give him the title of Morenu because the, we don't give that title to single people. And he's not married, so, uh, so I can't do it. But you should just know that he is a knowledgeable person. Um, and so if not for this minor technicality, I would absolutely give him that title. But that was not to last for very long. He did get married. He married Fromit Guggenheim in 1762. Here we have a copy of a love letter written in, uh, in, in Hebrew or Hebraic German, not Yiddish. We'll see why Moses Mendelssohn despised Yiddish. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. He married her in 1762, and they have 10 children, only si of whom six survive into adulthood. Uh, Recha, Joseph, um, one second. Uh, um, Abraham, Abraham was the father of the composer Felix Mendelssohn, Henrietta, Brendel, and Nathan. And yes, for those members of the Shar, Nathan Mendelssohn, I know that that is a significant name in the Shar, but uh, as far as I know, Moses Mendelssohn was not a Kohen and Cantor Nathan Mendelssohn was a Kohen, so no, no relation. But, uh, but, this, but nevertheless, that name was significant. Now, what happened with his children? We'll talk about that in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, Remember that Berlin at the time is undergoing significant, uh, significant intellectual upheavals, and not only and, and there is a tremendous interest in literature, and not only uh, literature as literature, but the Bible is also viewed as a work of literature. And there were many translations that were available of the Bible, but they had nothing to do with Judaism at all, meaning they were written by Christians, or if they were written by Jews, they had nothing to do with traditional Judaism. And Mendelssohn felt that a translation was needed that would speak to the younger generation who demanded beauty aesthetics in what they chose to read. And since what they chose to read outside of any religious context was of the highest standard of German, then they should also be presented with a translation of the Bible, of the Torah, that met the same standards. Uh, if, and if there is not such a work that's available to them, we will lose them. Either they will look to other non-traditional sources, or they won't be interested in the Torah altogether. So he, so he wrote, so he en endeavored to undertake this project of translating the Torah. In fact, he himself only translated the volume on Shemot. The other four volumes were translated by others. His children's tutor, he enlisted, and he writes here, I wish to dedicate the remains of my strength for the benefit of my children or a goodly portion of the nation. He was physically weak uh, by bringing Jews close to culture from which my nation, alas, is kept in such a distance. Remember that Jews were not allowed to participate often in entertainment. As Cantor Zellermeyer spoke about on Shabbos, oftentimes the synagogue took the place of the entertainment from which Jews were barred 
from participating. And so Jews are kept away from culture. So we have to create our own culture. And I want to do this by giving them a better translation of the holy books than they, uh, than they previously had. The other uh, sections were translated by, um, by known masculine, by no, um, intellectuals and light people who were not necessarily on the path of traditional Judaism or who were uh, who very much towed the line uh, between what tra tra traditionalist Judaism and what might be called the reformers. Um, Hertz, Naftali Hertz Vesely, Hertz Gomberg, Aaron Yaroslav, and the known masculine Solomon Dubna, who was the tutor of the children of Moses Mendelssohn. Now, whenever you in, uh, endeavor to undertake a translation, uh, the, the challenge is, what do you focus on when you're translating? Are you going to translate the actual, the, the words, just the words? Are you going to tr tr focus on the themes and the values? Are you going to try and bring out the literary quality of the text that you're attempting to translate? Every translator of any language has always, you know, aside from trying to convey what the words actually say, has had to wrestle with this issue. And Moses Mendelssohn was not any different. Uh, the Biur aims to emphasize the aesthetic of the translation and the aesthetic of the literature, the Bible as a literary text. It emphasizes the literary nature of the Bible while trying to anticipate theological and textual challenges. Sometimes when texts are encountered that, uh, that present theological and textual challenges, in fact, the, suddenly the text, the translation becomes a little bit less flowery. It almost is an effort to kind of uh, play down what these theological challenges might be. But there's also another issue when you're translating the Torah, which is that there is a lot of literature in the works of Chazal and the works of our sages that translates words differently than what the simple words might be. So, uh, so there's a couple of uh, um, the so a couple of uh, points. Number one, that uh, when he used flowery German, Moses Mendelssohn did very high level German. It's almost like he was trying to improve upon the text. He he almost he almost goes overboard. But uh, he uh, sometimes when he faced these challenges, he paraphrased. He paraphrased the original. Number two is that he used the cantillation notes, the trap. When we read the Torah, he used that as an essential ingredient in explaining the meaning of the words, which means that sometimes, based on the, the trap, he would take the same word and translate it differently in different places, which kind of makes sense because sometimes the same word could mean different things in different contexts. And then... Also, he sometimes did quote the literature of Chazal, of our sages, especially when describing the details of certain mitzvot. So I'll give you an example. When the Torah says, an eye for an eye, ayin tachat ayin, our sages tell us that that means, that, that doesn't mean that if one person uh, strikes another person's eye or pokes another person's eye out, we poke their eye out as well. What it means is that you have to compensate them. Ayin tachat ayin means money. When Moses Mendelssohn translates that, uh, he actually says that it means money, that ayin tachat ayin means money. He doesn't use a literal translation. There are other places as well where he relies on the literature of uh, Chazal uh, for, to, uh, for the same purpose. I'm going to uh, exit the sharing for a moment to see if anybody sent any uh, questions in. Let me just see. Um, uh, ta -ta. No. Okay. Here we go. Um, and we begin once again. Okay. Now, Mendelssohn did seek rabbinic approbations for his book. Um, he didn't seek many of them. But there was one person that he did contact. His name was Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Levin. Uh, he was previously the chief rabbi of London, where he was known as Hart Lion, Rabbi Hart Lion. The, um, 
he moved from London to Berlin, became the chief rabbi of Berlin. And so in 1783, he writes an introduction, a, 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 a hakdama, an introduction, which is also a haskama, which is a rabbinic approbation uh, to, this, uh, to this work. There are not many people from the nations of the world, there are, sorry, many people from the nations of the world in whose hearts God has placed a belief in the Torah of Moses. And that's, there are many non-Jews that know Tanakh. And that is still true. And if you don't believe me, please come visit us right here in Texas, and I will show you many non-Jews who know Tanakh very, very well, <clears throat> better than many Jews, better than I might say most Jews. And they know the holy prophets as well, and they understand the text, and they have translated it. There are a lot of Bible translations out there. But the thing is that um, Jews, they don't have a language, he says. Jews don't have a language. This is a not-so-veiled dig at Yiddish, which Moses Mendelssohn viewed as an undignified uh, expression. Of course, we know that that's not true, but Moses Mendelssohn very much felt that it was undignified and uncivilized for Jews to be speaking a dialect, a vernacular. Um, and uh, there's nobody among the Jews who really understands the language of the text and who can translate it. A wise man, Moses Dessau, who is an expert in various Torah disciplines, as well as the German language. There is no one like him, even one in a thousand. And so he, he says, he is fitting, and I, I, I think that this uh, translation is just, is absolutely phenomenal, and I think that everybody should, uh, everybody should read it. Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Levin. Okay, I'm going to read it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm trying to mute it, but I, I couldn't see. Hang on. Let me see if I could help. Where is the muting? Is it video or live? Live. Okay. Want to watch it? Not really. Uh, yeah. One second. Hang on. Um, give me yeah, a Sorry. Um, one moment. Okay. Here we go. Um, one moment. Okay. And we're back. Um, the, um, Another rabbi who weighed in in favor of, um, of, of the Beor was Rabbi Saul Berlin. He was the chief rabbi and the Avbethin of Frankfurt an der Oder. That is not to be confused with the major Jewish community of Frankfurt. Of course, Frankfurt am Main. Now, this was a dubious approbation if ever there was one because Saul Berlin was probably one of the most notorious Jewish forgers of all time. When I say was probably, what I mean is that he may have, it probably did forge 392 responsa of the Rosh, of Asher ben Yechiel, that essentially many of the, the purpose of many of these was to validate Haskalah positions. Um, the, uh, it's not clear, they, they, these were called Bissamim Rosh, and it's not clear how many of them uh, were actual forgeries, how many of them were real but he was an inveterate uh, forger. So an approbation from him is not necessarily one that you could or should take to the bank. There were others, other illustrious rabbis who subscribed to the Beor. Now, what did, that, what did that mean to subscribe? It's kind of like when a lehavdil, when a book uh, is going to be published uh, in a month and you already sign up on Amazon so that when the book comes out, you get it. That's what used to happen. That's what ha used to happen. People would pay publishing houses, and when the book that they wanted was was printed, they would get copies of it. The subscription list for the Beor included Rabbi Akiva Eger, who was one of the great leaders of the time, living in uh, in Prussia. Uh, a, a, a Rabbi Yaakov Tzvi Mecklenburg, one of the um, leading figures 
and, uh, who was tried to bridge the, the gap between the, uh, those, the younger generation who was under the influence of the Haskalah and the older, more traditional generation. Um, the, uh, but it is not, it would not be accurate to say that every rabbi was in favor of this. At the moment, it seems like the only objectionable thing about it was nothing, right? Doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with it. It's a translation, right? It's a translation that follows the words of our sages. It takes into account the uh, the the trop, the cancellations. Doesn't seem like there is anything wrong with this at all. So what? Um, so what? So what? What could it be? <clears throat> rabbi Yechezkel Landau, the chief rabbi, the Av Beit Din of Prague, he was one of those who was vehemently opposed. Um, first, he said that the uh, the the flowery language of the Bior meant that um, the 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 heretics especially this is a way of them snaring your children right you and and you this is a trap because you you're not going to understand the german you have, you're going to have to look up you're going to spend so much time looking up these highfalutin german words that you are going to um that you're going to uh it's going to take away from the primary purpose uh, which is the study of the torah and not only that because there are so many heretics who study Bible, you're not going to know who is teaching your children, especially if they are educated by this beer. Um, the uh, you you might be there might be a heretic that is teaching your child Chumash in your house, under your roof, under your nose. You might be having someone who is feeding your children dangerous ideas. And these dangerous ideas can be found in the likes of these of, of these translations. This translation has spread in our days. It says the German translation has spread. The beer, it entices the reader to read non-Jewish books to understand the language. It starts with a dictionary. And then who knows what else you're going to read. This is the beginning of a slippery slope. Make sure to educate your children in the ways of the Torah Seat them amongst no Torah scholars, meaning Torah scholars, not Bible scholars. And when your child has to study biblical text, hire a teacher who reveres God, who's a Torah scholar. And there is so much, he said, in our generation, the note, this, the Rabbi Cheskalando, the author of the response, the Nota Yehuda, this is in his commentary, Tzion Le Nefesh Chaya on Tractate Brachot. He was one of the most vehement and implacable opponents of the Haskalah, and this is where, and he cho chooses to bring some of this op opposition into his commentary, and he does it in, as well into his responsa. There is so much to rebuke about this in our generation when the Ill illness has grown so widespread. May heaven have mercy on us. Rabbi Shlomo Kluger of Brody in Galicia, uh, was asked about um, about somebody who found a copy of this work of the Bior and burned it. He turned it from Bior with an Aleph to Bior with an Ayin, which means incineration. Uh, the um, And he wanted to know, this person wanted to know whether they needed to compensate the original owner for the damage that is incurred as a result of destroying this tax. And also, was this something that he should have done? So he made five points. Number one, uh, the people who burned it, they really weren't required to, uh, and they probably shouldn't have done it, but not because it didn't deserve to be burned, but because it's a bad idea to yield to these zealous impulses to burn books. Burning books is bad. Uh, I think we take that as axiomatic. Burning books is bad because it is a bad, if you end up burning books, that are not kosher, you'll end up burning books that are kosher, and it's just a very counterproductive, antisocial way of uh, expressing your anger. Number That's number one. Number two, that doesn't mean that it is kosher, though. And he says something fascinating. He says, everybody says that it's trafe, 
And if everybody says that it's problematic, it must be that it is problematic because he says, kol hamon kekol shakai. The voice of vox populi, the voice of the populace is like the voice of God. And therefore, if everybody says that it's problematic, it must be that it is problematic. Um, number three writes, it is a fact that Moses Mendelssohn studied with prominent people. He had a very illustrious teacher, but he says there are many prominent people who had great Torah scholars who had students who did not, let's say, do them proud, who were not, uh, didn't keep the chain of transmission, the chain of tradition going. So you can, you should never hold people's students against them, nor should you ever assume that just because they study with industrious people, that is a seal of approval. Number four, his students, Moses Mendelssohn's students, are, when it comes to Judaism and when it comes to basic knowledge, they are the weakest of the weak. No one of consequence, no one of any level of Jewish learning whatsoever um, studied with him, and no one of any consequence or learning thinks highly of his work. Now, we saw that that's not true. But in Rav Shlomo Kluger's world, that was true. And number five, he wrote, I, I never read, I never looked at the work. So everything that he said before, I, I've never read it, but, and I don't know that there's anything prohibited in it, but this I know. Translating the Tanakh into German is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. It's inappropriate. He has caused, he sinned and he caused others to sin. And from this, the old illness has spread in Hamburg where they pray in German. Anybody know what he's talking about? The very first reformed temple was in Hamburg. They prayed in the vernacular. They, inst they installed, they sat with mixed seating. They installed an organ. All sorts of reforms, hence the name reform, took place starting in Hamburg. And uh, Rev. Shlomo Kluger was an opponent of that, of course. And it's, it's, it all started with Moses Mendelssohn. He lay blame for the reform movement at the feet of Moses Mendelssohn. In his last will and testament, the Chatam Sofer, the son-in-law of Rabbi Kiva Eger, who was a subscriber to the Bior, he wrote, Uvisifre Ramad al Tishlechuyad. It's a poem. To the never lay a hand on the works of Rabbi of Rabbi Moses Dessau. Now it's interesting. He does write Ramad. The, the Reish stands for Reb or Rab. It is an honorific title of some kind. He is acknowledging perhaps that he was a knowledgeable and learned Jew, but you should never touch it. There are those who felt that this was an this is a printing error, that he never said Ramad, Rabbi Moses Dessau. He actually said Chemed, that the race should be a chet. Chemed al What does Sifre Chemed mean? Erotica. Do not uh, don't read romance novels. Don't read erotic literature. Now, it's hard to say why the Khatam Sofer would include this in his last will and testament when it wasn't really even a thought that his illustrious descendants would be busying them, would, would be occupying their time with trashy, smutty literature, even though it certainly was available. No, so uh, Professor Schneer Lyman uh, wrote a very <coughs> convincing piece in which he says that the idea that that's what it says is completely preposterous. There's no question that the Khatam Sofer was very much opposed to the work of Moses Mendelssohn. And he tells a story, a story told by Rabbi Hillel Lichtenstein, who was a student of the Khatam Sofer, to his son-in-law, Rabbi Lichtenstein's son-in-law, uh, Rabbi Akiva Yosef Schlesinger, who was also known as the Lev Ha'ivri, Akiva Yosef Schlesinger. Uh, what happened was that uh, whenever the Khatam Sofer visited a different community, he would go home with the rabbi after services on Shabbos morning, and uh, he would and he would tell the rabbi to deliver a sermon. Now, what it's a little strange to him telling the rabbi to deliver a sermon around the Shabbos table, but you have to understand that back then, the communal rabbi spoke twice a year, maybe if once or twice more than that. Um, he delivered eulogies, but formal sermons took place on Shabbat Shuvah 
the Shabbos between Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and Shabbos Agadol, the Shabbos before Pesach. Um, and many times those sermons were the length of like every other sermon of the year combined. They would go for hours at a time. But that was when they spoke. So before you pine for the good old days when the rabbi only spoke twice a year, just recognize that he spoke twice a year for four or five hours at a time. Um, so he, whenever the Khatam Sover would go to other communities, nowadays they call it scholar in residence. Whenever the Khatam Sofer would go to other communities, he would come home with the rabbi after, after, the, after davening, and he would tell the rabbi to deliver a sermon, and then he would deliver a sermon. But, the, but he never quoted psukim, he never quoted verses, uh, biblical verses from memory. He quoted them um, only from the written text. And so he goes to the home of Rabbi Hillel Lichtenstein, and uh, Rabbi Hillel Lichtenstein only had three editions of the Chumash. One was a one from, that was printed in Amsterdam, and that he kept at his seat in Shul. Another one was an edition that was printed in Vienna, and his wife kept that in her seat at Shul. So anybody that tells you that women didn't used to go to Shul, that's not accurate. At the very least, Rebetzin Lichtenstein, she did go to Shul, and she had a copy in her at, at her seat. So there was only one copy left at their house, and that was Moses Mendelssohn's Biur. So the Khatam Sofer asked for a Chumash, and uh, Rahila Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein brings him a copy of the beer, and he, the Khatam Sofer, is appalled. He's horrified. How could it be that you don't have a Chumash in your home, A, and B, that the only Chumash that you do have in your home is this one? And in fact, he said it's better to quote the text by heart than to quote from this book. Uh, later on, uh, wrote, uh, one, uh, his very close faithful student named Rav Hirsch Turnow, who was basically a member of the Khatam Sofer's family, even though he didn't, I don't think, marry into his family. He explained to him what happened that Rav Hill Lichtenstein, one copy was at his seat, the other copy his wife's seat, and this is the only one he had at home. And then he says, but also, Rebbe, what's so bad? There's nothing, I, I reviewed it, uh, and, uh, and I couldn't find anything wrong. Reb Hill Lichtenstein told him the same thing later on. The Khatam Sofer rebuked him for, for this. And he said, I don't understand. What's wrong with it? And he said, uh, first of all, uh, I, I've seen known, I've seen rabbinic approbations for it. Known Torah scholars have told me that there's no problem with it. The Khatam Sofer said that that rabbi that told you that it was fine, he made a mistake. And also, Moses Mendelssohn was a heretic. And if you have, uh, and if you don't believe me, look up and he gave a source in Devarim, in Deuteronomy. We don't have the source because this is just a testimony from Hilla Lichtenstein, Rav Hilla Lichtenstein, and he didn't quote the source in Devarim that the uh, Khatam Sofer thought was heretical. There were other rabbis that did support it. We mentioned the rabbis that subscribed. Rabbi Yaakov Weil was a great uh, rabbi in Germany, he said, and, and also a vehement opponent of the reform movement, he uh, said that, in fact, you could use this as a translation for doing what we call shnayim mikra ve'echad targum. You're supposed to review the Torah text twice in the text and once in the translation. Usually we take that to mean the translation of onkelos in Aramaic. But he said that if you use a vernacular translation, like the Beor of Moses Mendelssohn, you fulfill your obligation. Um, Rev. Yaakov C. Mecklenburg, whom we mentioned, the author of the Kitab Kabbalah, he quoted the Bior. Now, he quoted the Bior to disagree with the Bior. But that didn't mean that, but the fact that he quoted it, he felt that it was uh, just a, a mistaken translation, not that it was an inappropriate, prohibited work as well. To this very day, not to this very day, but as far back as nearly 40 years ago. At the time, Rabbi Avi Shafrin taught in a yeshiva in Providence, Rhode Island. Now he is a columnist from the more right-wing, the Aguda world. This was in a now defunct magazine, The Jewish Observer. It said that Moses Nelson was not a bad Jew. He was just convinced that he knew better than those who were the unchallenged Torah giants of his time. In essence, this is it, right. It is my thesis that Mendelssohn's mistake can be seen as nothing more than varied manifestations of one central pervasive theme, a lack of regard for the opinions of Torah scholars and the gedolim of his time. In essence, this is the doctrine of what we call Das Torah, that you're supposed to consult 
rabbinic luminaries of the generation, and that uh, they, w w whether it's on matter, uh, certainly on theological matters, matters pertaining to Torah study, and even matters pertaining to your personal life and decisions that you make. Um, this is, uh, and so Moses Mendelssohn was essentially a from guy. He just had this one basic flaw that he felt he could go it alone. Rabbi Avi Shafrin uh, aroused a, a great deal of controversy with this remark uh, in that others felt that Moses Mendelssohn was the founder of the Haskalah, the founder of the reform movement. Rabbi Yaakov Perlau, the late Nova Minsker Rebbe, wrote that Moses Mendelssohn was an observant Jew, but culturally he was a thoroughbred German. Schizophrenia of values, a falsification of the Torah ideal that was doomed to fail. But was it really doomed to fail? There are tons of very from translations into the vernacular of the Torah text that use the highest standards of that language, whether it is Spanish or German or Russian or French or English, whatever it is, there are plenty of them. And some extraordinarily devout publishing houses Art Scroll, Koran, you name it, the enterprise of translating the Torah into high level vernacular, that, that language is one that continues to this very day. So it's hard to say that the enterprise was doomed to fail. It may be that the product that Moses Mendelssohn was selling was doomed to fail. And it's not the only reason that he was controversial. He wrote other works. Jerusalem, the, his work Jerusalem was especially controversial. It asserted the, that uh, it kind of denied a, um, na a nationalist element to Judaism, a connection to any type. The Judaism should be more of a culture. It, it, there's a plenty of time. There's not enough time to talk about why Jerusalem was a controversial work. Um, is, is certainly after the beer was controversial. Once the beer was controversial, then anything else they wrote after that was certainly controversial. Um, it's also true that Moses Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn was himself a devout Jew. He was a very from person, but his children were not. Uh, for his son Abraham, that we made reference to earlier, was a well-known banker. He joined his brother Joseph's banking firm and he converted to Protestant Christianity, and he took on the last name Bartholdi. He's married a nice Jewish girl named Leah Salomon, and he was the father of the great composers Felix Mendelssohn and Fanny Mendelssohn, who uh, would have been known as, as great a composer as her brother if she had not had the misfortune to be born as a woman in the 1800s when women were not supposed to be doing stuff like this but she was a very talented composer in her own right. Unfortunately, both Fanny and Felix died very young. Um, Fanny in her 30s and Felix not long afterwards at the age of 38 um, from what they say was a broken heart, but he was a person of extraordinarily, it was a complicated person, very talented individual, of course. On Friday, I was preparing for this class a little bit and, I, uh, and then I got into my car and a piano trio by Felix Mendelssohn was playing. And I took that as a sign, which undoubtedly Moses Mendelssohn would not have because he was a rationalist. Um, the, uh, the, those, a Abraham Mendelssohn, Nathan Mendelssohn, because this is the Shar. Nathan Mendelssohn was an extraordinarily prominent um, engineer. He designed many uh, tools, instruments, uh, and uh, secured many patents, was extremely well regarded. Um, Joseph Mendelssohn was a prominent banker. His daughters married well as well. His daughter Recha married uh, the, um, the daughter of Moses Mendelssohn's best friend. His name was, I believe, Herman Meyer. Unfortunately, that marriage did not last. She ended up moving to Berlin. She lived next to her, um, her brother, uh, Abraham. She opened a boarding school for girls and, um, and she died, uh, I, I'm not sure how old she was when she died, but that but she was an educator. Um, of Moses Mendelssohn's descendants, only his grandson Alexander, who was the son of Joseph Mendelssohn, was the last descendant of Moses Mendelssohn to practice Judaism. 
many of his children had already abandoned Judaism. And I don't just mean abandoned Judaism in the sense of not being non-practicing Jews. I mean what we call gishmadet. They, they, uh, they apostatized. Abraham Mendelssohn, perhaps being the most famous, but even Felix Mendelssohn recognized that he was of Jewish origin. He talked. He would say. He said that for, that the non-Jews always suspected him of being Jewish, and he couldn't deny that he was a Jewish origin, and that the Jews didn't feel that he was Jewish enough because he was a practicing uh, Protestant. And this is what what happened to Moses Mendelssohn as well, to some degree. Um, he was accused by the Orthodox of being a reformer. This is a quote from your own Professor Alan Nadler. He was. Uh, considered a reformer by the Orthodox, which he wasn't. He was personally very much a halachically observant Jew, which the reformers ridiculed that he was a uh, that he was a halachic. He was a frumayit, which is certainly the old school reformers had no patience for. The Yiddishists hated him because he disdained their language. The Zionists felt that he was a turncoat that he denied the nationalist aspect of Judaism. And so as a result, despite the fact that the enterprise that he engaged in of translating the text of the Torah uh, was one that was met with controversy, it endures. But Moses Mendelssohn's philosophical legacy speaks for no Jews today. A sad position to be in, to be sure, but it is uh, very telling. It is very telling that oftentimes even though you can say that the ban failed, you, uh, you can still get copies of the Beor. You can find it on hebrewbooks.org, for example, and look at your bookshelves. Any translation that you have of Tanakh to some degree owes, uh, its, um, it owes its, itself to the, uh, to the Beor of Moses Mendelssohn. But what, the bigger picture of what he stood for did not last very much past his own lifetime. Thank you so much for joining me next week. And I hope you will join me next week. We're going to talk about the Toldot Yaakov Yosef, uh, which means, and Biur means, uh, sorry, I should have, Biur means uh, explanation uh, because the translation is a little bit of a commentary as well. The Toldot Yaakov Yosef is the first ever published work of Hasidut, and it aroused a firestorm. So I hope that you will join me next week, same time, same station, and I thank you for joining me now. Um, if you have any questions, I am still here, and please feel free. Unmute yourself and identify yourself if you do. On behalf of everyone, I'll just start off by saying thank you, Rabbi Rakowski. It was very interesting and learned a lot about uh, origins of translation of Tanakh that I really appreciate today. <laughs> thank you. When I put in the chat my email address once again. And uh, again, if, if if you don't want to reach out now, I don't want to say anything, please feel free to reach out um, anytime. And I look forward to... Uh, I look forward to, to getting to know you better. Thank you very much. It was a most interesting lecture. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Okay.